This is the World History Midterm Review video. You can look at this video, you can listen to it, you can use it to fill out your review. I'm going to go through these questions with you, and hopefully this will prepare you very well for the midterm exam. So let's have fun. The Neolithic Revolution, that's going way back, all the way back to the beginning of the semester. What is the Neolithic Revolution? The Neolithic Revolution was when man learned to farm and domesticate animals. And that completely changed our entire existence, as you know, with rice swag, which we will discuss in a second, and all of its implications. When did it happen? It happened somewhere between 8,000 and 10,000 years ago. There was no civilization yet. There were no written records. Archaeologists go by the artifacts that they find. So what led to the... Neolithic Revolution. Let's see if I can bring this up a little bit. Here is what people think. Big game animals that our ancestors hunted began to disappear and became harder to find either because these animals couldn't cope with climate change, an ice age was ending, or because people were overhunting them, or both. At the same time, people's migratory patterns that they followed as they hunted caused them to realize that plants were growing in the exact same places where they had discarded uneaten seeds the year before. And people started to realize that they had some control and some impact upon the, the, the plants that were growing naturally in the environment that they had been harvesting and eating from. And an ending ice age may also have contributed to this process as well by causing longer growing seasons to happen. Higher overall temperatures equals a longer growing season. So how did a surplus in food create different jobs? In other words, specialization of labor. And that is answered in the economy part of our spec chart. And you can use your notes to fill this chart out, but I'm kind of going to go through the, this with you. Like, for example, the Paleolithic era versus the Neolithic era. Remember that Paleolithic means before man learned how to farm. Neolithic means after man learned how to farm and domesticate animals, but still in this stone age. And so let's look at the, the social aspect of Paleolithic era versus Neolithic era. Paleolithic era, you had social equality and you also had gender equality. But over here in the Neolithic era, era social classes become based on jobs and gender. So you have the emergence of social classes based on those two things. So let's look at the political end. In the Paleolithic era, there were no governments. There were no law codes. There were no borders. There were no armies. There were no nations. You had clans and you had families, and elders made the decisions because of their experience. But over here in the Neolithic period, suddenly complex governments began to emerge to regulate and protect the food supplies. You had monarchy. You had patriarchy. Kings, priests, and warriors made the decisions. So let's look at the economic side. In the Paleolithic era, people hunted and gathered for food. And you couldn't store food, and you couldn't carry that much food. So you hunted and gathered what you needed to eat that day. And trade between people was almost non-existent because different clans and families all survived the same way, doing basically the same thing. But in the Neolithic period. Uh, people led a more settled existence, which meant that you could harvest and you could store more than was needed on any given day. And we call this a food surplus, which meant that uh, some people in society could devote themselves to pursuits other than growing food, such as artists and warriors and priests, weavers, stone um, cutters, merchants, tanners, um, etc. And we call this specialization of labor. And now you have a basis for trade between settlements and societies because different groups of people will naturally specialize and do certain things better or more cheaply than other groups. 
So let's look at the cultural. In the Paleolithic era, people did have a primitive mobile culture with various rituals. Cave art has been discovered in a lot of places. Religiously, they were spiritual. They practiced forms of animism, possibly something that we might call polytheism. But there was no organized religion. There was no class of priests or temples. There were no holy books, etc. But in the Neolithic era, you have the emergence of the arts because of this food surplus and because of this specialization of labor. These things interrelate. You have, because of that, you have painting, you have sculpture, literature, poetry, architecture such as temples and pyramids and palaces and you have organized religion with its priests and holy books and elaborate rituals and ethical codes of behavior become important aspects of life for everyone and then the demographics demo means people so demographics is basically the study of movements and patterns among people and on the Paleolithic side, people lived and spread out in h small hunting and gathering groups. You couldn't hunt and gather enough in any one place to support a larger group than that. And so uh, people didn't live in any one place. Instead, they were nomadic. They followed seasonal migratory patterns year after year that followed the migratory patterns of the animals that they hunted. If you look at the Neolithic era in the demographic view, that's quite a bit different. People began to settle and live where they were growing and storing the food. You couldn't just leave it. Um, and this led to the building of structures to protect the food and to villages and eventually to towns and cities. And these settled places now could support large populations because of the food surplus that we talked about. And these new urban populations accommodated that specialization of labor that we've talked about. And so now we move on to the characteristics of civilization. And here's where we get rice swag. And let's take a look at this and then we'll describe each one. These are the things that generally speaking, a civilization needs to have going for it to be a civilization. And you can come up with the acronym rice swag. So R, R is for religion. And so what are some examples of some, some things that you can think about with regard to religion? Well, it's organized with temples and a priestly class, gods, holy books, rituals, sacrifices, ethical codes, theocracies, polytheism, monotheism, etc., and then I. I is for innovations. And what kinds of innovations can we think of? Well, for example, irrigation, the wheel, the cart, the sail, the sundial, writing. C. C is for cities and or culture. What can we think of when we think of cities in this new Neolithic period, this new uh, period that comes along with the agricultural revolution. Well, cities are permanent with cut stone or mud bricks, streets, temples, water supplies, sewers, public spaces, and even urban planning. E right here, E is for economics. What can we think of when we think of economics in a civilization, especially an early one? Well, we can think of things like trade, transport, transactions, merchants, record keeping, and specialization of labor. And many of these things in rice swag, they all interrelate with each other. S, S is for social structure. And a good definition of a social structure addresses such questions as, for example, who is on top? Who's on the bottom? Who is above you? Who is below you? Who is better than you? Who is not as good as you? And so some examples of social structure that we can think of is this, social classes. 
based upon characteristics like gender, occupation, heredity, ethnicity, education, race, etc. W is for some kind of writing system. And what are some early examples that we can think of for a writing system? Things that we'll talk about in a second. Things like cuneiform, hieroglyphs, transaction records, holy books, law codes, literature, poetry, sagas, things like that. A is for agriculture. And this one is the most fundamental. If you don't have this one, then you have none of the other things in rice swag. So what are some examples of agriculture? What are some things that we can think of when we think of agriculture in a civilization, especially an early one? Well, of course, you've got farming, irrigation, plowing, sowing, harvesting, herding and breeding of animals. G is for government, some kind of a governmental structure. And what can we think of when we think of government in this new uh, Neolithic era? Monarchs, a patriarchal society, law codes, taxes, city-states, armies, and empires. So let's go to Hammurabi's code. Who was Hammurabi? Well, he was a Mesopotamian, more specifically a Babylonian, and more specifically a Babylonian king. Mesopotamia was a hodgepodge of many city-states and ethnic areas. Sumerians were Mesopotamians. So when you're talking about Sumerians, you're talking about a group of Mesopotamians. And we're when you're talking about Babylonians, you're talking about a group of Mesopotamians. And Hammurabi managed to control several Mesopotamian city-states at once and founded a new city called Babylon. Hammurabi wrote the first form of written law code. And he wrote this law code in order to unify and provide some glue for this diverse empire. What is a common way to do that that we see in history over and over and over again? Come up with a law code that everybody can read and everybody can understand and everybody can follow and everybody knows what to do with in this empire that you've got, particularly when it's made up of diverse peoples. He had his codes posted in writing on large pillars all around his empire so that everyone could see and read them and understand them for themselves. So what river valley civilization was Hammurabi's empire located in? And once again, that's Mesopotamia. Keep in mind that there were four river valley civilizations. You had, the, you had Mesopotamia, the Nile River Valley, the Indus River Valley, and the Yellow River Valley. And so let's go into some more detail about these river valley civilizations. These were the first civilizations. And so what we've got is a chart where we can fill a few things out. Let's start with the Indus River Valley civilization. This location was in modern day Pakistan. A lot of times we say India, but until 1947, India and Pakistan was part of India. Innovations. This civilization was known for its urban planning and its, and its sewage systems. Also, this was the first civilization to export cotton cloth. Religion. It seems to have been polytheistic. We can't read their writing. It seems to have been a precursor of Hinduism, um, another very ancient religion from the same general area, and it is most definitely classified as a polytheistic religion. Type of government. The Indus River Valley civilization had more than, than 10,000 cities and settlements. This was the largest of the four River Valley civilizations, but we can't read their writing, so we don't really know how centralized this civilization was. Mesopotamia, we've got a question here. Who were the Sumerians and what did the lack of resources in this area force the people to do? So it's location. Location is modern-day Iraq between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Mesopotamia means between the rivers in Greek. Geographically, this region lacked a lot of resources such as wood, stone, and metals like tin, 
and this made long-distance trade essential for the Mesopotamians. Innovations. Innovations such as cuneiform writing, the cart and the sail, the sundial, adobe brick, the ziggurat, epic poetry, bronze tools such as weapons and farm implements. Religion. Polytheism. The gods in Mesopotamia were harsh, moody, and unpredictable, which makes sense since the environment and these two rivers were harsh, moody, and unpredictable. Let's look at the type of government. Independent city-states with monarchs at the top were the type of governments that they had, although at sometimes these independent city-states were unified into empires such as Akkad and the Babylonian Empire. The Nile River Valley Civilization. We've got a question here. What is the gift of the Nile? Well, maybe we can find out. Location is in Egypt. Innovations, lots of them. Hieroglyphics, right? Written on a plant-based material uh, called papyrus, which was lighter and more flexible than the clay tablets that the Mesopotamians, the Sumerians, were using. Um, advances included pyramids and advances in geometry and astronomy and medical advances, including, if you want to call it that, mummification. Religion, once again, polytheism. The gods in Egypt were nice because the Nile River was nice and uh, predictable. And because of that, the Egyptians expected a nice afterlife. Hence, mummification because you're going to need your body in this nice, wonderful afterlife. Type of government. It's very different from the Mesopotamia. The Nile was easy to navigate, which facilitated a unified government, which was a monarchy with the pharaoh at the top. And the pharaoh uh, was also a viewed as being a god. So the Egyptian government was a theocracy because the pharaoh was a god king. Let's move over to the Yellow River civilization in China, or the Huang Ha civilization. Its location was the Yellow River. Innovations such as Chinese characters in writing, silk, bronze art as well as bronze tools, such as decorated ceremonial vessels. Religion was slightly different. The big thing to remember about the Chinese religion in this ancient civilization is ancestor worship. And remember, we went into some more detail about that as well. Type of government, a monarchy, with the addition of the belief in the dynastic cycle. And there's also no small amount of theocracy. The Shang ruling dynasty family from about 1700 BC functioned also as high priests who offered ritual sacrifices to royal ancestors who apparently uh, got extra special worship. All right, some map questions. Filling it, fill out the missing parts of the map. Now, this part I'm not going to do. I think you've got enough information to be able to do that yourself. And so let's go past this map chart and move on to the important things to know. Some definitions and some background, too. Some further elaboration and explanation. Um, monarchy. Mono, mono means one. And monarchy means one ruler, whether that's a king or a pharaoh or an emperor, etc. City-state. This is a city that is its own sovereign nation with its own ruler, its own territory, even its own gods, maybe. A theocracy. A theocracy is when the religious leaders are also the political leaders and vice versa, such as the pharaoh in Egypt or the Shang dynasty in China. So a theocratic government is basically the same thing. A theocratic government is a theocracy. Let's move on to polytheism. Polytheism is the belief in multiple gods. Poly means many. And so um, a religion that has such a system is said to be polytheistic. 
monotheism. Mono means one, so monotheistic is the belief in just one God. And so a religion that has just one God is said to be monotheistic. And so what are three examples of monotheistic religions? And we're going to have Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Specialization of labor. Remember that when different people specialize in different jobs, rather than everybody just doing the same thing, that's specialization of labor. Economic production becomes much more efficient when you have specialization of labor because it allows people to concentrate on getting really good at their specialty. The Fertile Crescent. This is another name for Mesopotamia and the region curving to the northwest around the northern end of the Arabian Desert and down south along the eastern end of the Mediterranean toward Egypt. It's fertile, it's crescent-shaped, and it's viewed as what we like to call the cradle of civilization. Cuneiform. Cuneiform is what we call the Mesopotamian writing system. Cuneiform means wedge-shaped in Greek, and it was engraved into wet clay tablets, which would then dry and become permanent records. Who created cuneiform? Um, the Sumerians did. The, Sumer the Sumerians were a civilization in the long and varied history of Mesopotamia. And uh, I have emphasized before that the, the Sumerians are one group, an early yet very sophisticated group, of Mesopotamians. The irrigation system. This is a, an irrigation system is a complex of ditches that are designed to control and direct the flooding of ri the river or rivers into your agricultural fields. Irrigation is absolutely essential if you want to grow food on a large scale. Whether you're in a harsh, unpredictable, unpredictable environment like Mesopotamia, or even if you're in a pleasant, easy environment like Egypt, you're still going to need irrigation. The gift of the Nile. This is the nickname that a Greek visitor gave to the land of Egypt, and it just stuck because it emphasized the importance of the Nile River and how much the Egyptian civilization centered on the Nile and depended on the Nile. So why did the settlements of Jarmo and Harappa help pave the way for future settlements? Well, Jarmo w was a very early permanent settlement in Mesopotamia long before civilization, which seems to have paved the way for permanent settlement. Harappa is an advanced city in the Indus River Valley that had more than 30,000 people and uh, had urban planning also. So both of these places, existing in different times and different places, contributed in their own way to this process of permanence and urbanization. So moving on from these river valley civilizations to the classical empires, and we got a basic question. What separates these classical empires from about 500 BC to about 680? from the early river valley civilizations. And so here is my big speech. So whether it's Greece under Alexander the Great or the Roman Empire or the Persian Empire or, or the, the Moira or the Gupta empires in India or the Qin and Han dynasties in China, all of these classical uh, civilizations had vast complex empires and large bureaucracies. Don't forget what a bureaucracy is. It's an organization made up of many departments and divisions that are administered by lots of people. And so uh, uh, what did these classical civilizations inherit from the earlier River Valley civilizations? They inherited the desire to centralize and gather their authority and their power into one place. The River Valley civilizations wanted to do this, um, but their geographical barriers, such as violent, unpredictable rivers, mountains, deserts, seas, often stopped them and kept them to the level of city-states. To the extent that these river valley civilizations could form centralized governments, they, they did. 
the Nile River Valley civilization went all the way with centralized authority because the Nile River was conducive to that purpose. Smaller localized empires did emerge in Mesopotamia like Akkad and Babylon. But the later classical civilizations that we've been studying here lately, they developed innovations that enabled them to overcome these geographical barriers. And these innovations included such things as a unified currency, such as metal coins, the phonetic writing systems, more representative and inclusive government systems like democracy and republicanism, more just and more fair legal codes and rules of law that we see like in the 12 tables, and the institution of cultural and religious tolerance like Persia and Rome and the Myra and the Gupta had. All of these innovations fostered greater trade, which meant more prosperity and greater unity across cultures and languages. And these classical period innovations made vast empires maintained by large complex bureaucracies possible. And all of these things also provided a level of prosperity that made it easier for art and science and mathematics to flourish. And these advances made it possible to develop new architectural techniques such as concrete and the arch and the dome to make more practical, more useful infrastructure such as roads, aqueducts, coliseums, canals, walls, etc. And we see this happening within roughly the same time frame in Greece, Rome, Persia, India, and China. So as we move forward, uh, keep all of these things in mind as you're learning about that in context. So let's talk about classical India. So what accomplishments occurred during the Gupta Empire? Well, they had accomplishments in medicine. For example, they had uh, identified 500 healing plants. They had printed medical guides. They had a thousand diseases classified. They had plastic surgery, inoculations. They could perform C-sections. They had advances in mathematics, the decibel system, the concept of zero, pi, advances in literature, for example, Kalidasa, uh, advances in astronomy like the solar calendar. They knew, as well as the ancient Greeks, that the earth was round. So when did the Gupta Empire exist? It existed between about 319 AD and about 550 AD. What advances did the Gupta Empire make? that are still in use today. And I think this is just a rephrasing of the previous question, so I think we can skip that one. I think we answered that one. So let, what led to the fall of the Gupta Empire? Successive groups of, of invading Huns from the Northwest weakened it, and it broke into separate Hindu kingdoms. What was the most common religion in the Gupta Empire? Hinduism. Hindu culture saw a big flourishing but Buddhism was allowed to thrive as well. Let's move on to classical Persia. What helped to unify the Persian Empire? Such things as the Royal Road with a Pony Express, metal coins to standardize the money, a unified system of weights and measures, 20 royal provinces with official administrative satraps who reported directly to the king, a standardized tax collecting system, and religious tolerance. And so when did the Persian Empire exist? That was from about 550 BC to about 330 BC. What led to the fall of the Persian Empire? Uh, Alexander the Great destroyed it. Classical China. Why did Emperor Qin Shi Huangdi adopt a legalist philosophy? I probably butchered that, but it's a written test. He believed that human beings were evil and selfish by nature and that harsh laws and methods were necessary to maintain the social order. So what is a legalist philosophy? In legalism, you attempt to control people's worst impulses to do wrong with the threat and the carrying out of severe impartial punishment when they do wrong. 
It's just the opposite of Confucianism, which believes in people's basic goodness and seeks to gently direct people toward good behavior. And that's why Shi Huan Di burned Confucianist books and persecuted Confucianist scholars, because you would too if you thought that cracking heads was the only way to control chaos. So when did the Qin Dynasty exist? It was a very short-lived dynasty. It, so, it, so it lasted not very long. Depends on how you count it. The Qin family ruled a kingdom before they ruled all of China for about 15 years before, between 221 BC and 206 BC. And what led to the fall of the Qin Dynasty? The Qin Dynasty was overthrown by a rebellion against its harsh rule, and several years of civil war followed. So when did the Han Dynasty exist? That lasted from 206 BC to 220 AD, so it straddled um, the, the line between BC and AD, or if you want to call it BCE and CE, and it lasted for about 425 years. And what led to the fall of the Han Dynasty? Weakness and corruption among Han emperors. A vast empire uh, like that was having difficulty fighting off invasions and rebellion among the peasants due to land shortages and economic hard times. So let's move on to classical Greece. What is a Hellenistic empire? That's an empire which promotes Greek culture and Greek learning into the territories and the cultures that it influences. So what is an oligarchy? That's rule by a few. Uh, Sparta was an example of this. There were two uh, kingly lines that ruled Sparta simultaneously, concurrently. One ruled the city and one was um, out in the, in the field conducting battle. The myst what mysteries of the earth did Greece discover? That it was round, and they even had an idea of its size. Now here's a question that's not on the review. I just put it in here real fast. How did Greek geography affect its political development? And there were several factors. First of all, there were no major rivers in Greece. You know, that's especially different from the river valley civilizations. Instead, Greece is a very mountainous and craggy place with isolated valleys and lots of rocky peninsulas and islands. And all of these factors were barriers to travel uh, and trade within Greece. And as a result, Greece was composed politically of lots of independent city-states. What kind of political system originated in Greece? The one that it's really known for, Athens, that is democracy. Now, what rights did citizens of Athens have? Well, they got to participate in the citizens' assembly. They could vote. They could serve in leadership roles in the government for pay. And even if you were poor, you could do all of these things as long as you had the status of citizen. So what rights did non-citizens of Athens have? Non-citizens could not do any of those things. Um, the vast majority of people in Athens were not citizens, including women, foreigners, and slaves. And you had no method, no means, no pathway for becoming a citizen. So what ideas originated in classical Greece? Here's a list. Philosophy, the phalanx, democracy, drama, comedies and tragedies, amphitheaters, levers, pulleys, water pumps, catapults, volume density, we're talking science, right? Volume and density, musical scales, history, architecture, realistic sculpture, mathematical ideas like geometry, Hellenism, and the Olympics. So that'll, that's, a, that's a list that'll get you started. When did the Greek Empire exist? And that existed from about 338 BC to about 323 BC. And then what led to the fall of the Greek Empire? Alexander the Great died unexpectedly at the age of 33, or maybe 32. Can't remember which one. 
After he died, his empire broke up into three parts, each one with one of his own generals serving as a dynastic monarch. Classical Rome. How did the role of women change during the classical period in Rome? Women had more equality in Rome than they had in Greece. Marriage and family was more important to Romans than to Greeks. Women could own property such as land or a business. They had the right to make a will and to leave that property to someone else of their own choosing. So when did the Roman Empire exist? Let's say about 27 BC to about 476 AD. So that's a little over... 500 years. That's the Roman Empire, not the Roman Republic. And what led to the collapse of the empire? Um, we tend to talk, chalk this up to four main things. And many of these are similar to what led to the fall of the Han Dynasty in China, although these empires were not affiliated with each other. Let's go down the list. Weak and corrupt leaders, especially emperors, the high cost of defending Rome's borders from invasion, and this led to higher taxes to pay for the military, which led to artificially minting more money to raise these taxes, which led to high inflation, which led to high unemployment. And to save money, the empire depended more and more on mercenary soldiers who have no loyalty and who fight for the highest bidder. Finally, Rome's borders were too big. They couldn't manage these extensive borders, which made ex invasions from Northern European and Central Asian tribes and Eastern European uh, barbaric tribes more successful. And so who influenced the Romans politically? The Greeks, who brought the ideas of republic and citizenship and voting to Rome and how did Romans make sure that no one branch of government had more power than the others? Each branch had specified legal powers. Sound familiar? And what does equality before the law of all citizens mean? Well, it means all citizens are subject to the same rules and laws. How did Rome contribute to the spread of Christianity? Let's not forget the Roman infrastructure the roads, that's paramount. Also, Rome was politically unified, so there weren't a lot of uh, internal borders and other political barriers to overcome. It, it was also the time of the Pax Romana, so you could travel in relative peace and safety. You also had a unified language. Now, um, we know that the language of the Romans, that the Romans were most known for, was Latin. But Christianity began in the far eastern part of the Roman Empire, and Greek was widely spoken throughout the eastern half of the Roman Empire due to the phenomenon that occurred before the Romans had an empire, and that phenomenon was, which we've already mentioned, Hellenism, thanks to Alexander the Great. So yes, Christianity did get a lot of help uh, spreading through the Roman Empire from a unified language, but that language was much more the Greek language than it was the Latin language. The, the message also of Christianity was appealing to the poor and the downtrodden, and Rome had a lot of poor and downtrodden people. It preached about a God that didn't judge by outward appearances. So the Edict of Milan, what was that? The Edict of Milan was issued by the Emperor Constantine and his brother-in-law, co-Emperor Lucinius, in the year 313, and it legalized Christianity and other beliefs, actually, in the empire. So what? how did the Edict of Milan impact Rome? Constantine was himself a Christian. Um, Licinius, emperor in the east, may have been a Christian. His wife definitely was. And the edict contains special benefits for Christians, including the return of property that was seized when uh, the previous emperor Diocletian had persecuted them. And most importantly, Rome became the center of the of Christian religion in Europe. And so we've got these civilizations. Which civilization is represented by each number on the map? 
So number one right here is the Greek civilization. Number two, that is the Persian Empire. Number three, in, here's India. You've got the Moira and the Gupta. And over here, number four, you've got the Han. So let's go to our religions table right here. So I'll name the, we've got several religions, or you might even call them belief systems. And then we have uh, these various categories over the top, founder or central figure, ethical code or standard of behavior. Was it monotheistic? Was it polytheistic or neither? And then what was the primary goal of this religion? And let's begin with this code of ethics called Confucianism. Its founder was Confucius. That was the founder, central figure. Ethical code of behavior. Well, Confucianism was all about relationships, and the most important relationship was between father and son. Confucius taught that if you want to understand how society is, is made up, what it comprises society, don't look at the individuals or the groups in society. Look at the relationships between people. That's where society lives and breathes. And the most important relationship, as far as he was concerned, the cornerstone of all the various types of relationships that there were, was between father and son. And so the ethical code of behavior came down to filial piety. Filial piety was the amount of reference and respect that a son gave to his father. Was it monotheistic, polytheistic, or neither? It was neither. Confucianism is not really a religion. It's more of a code of behavior. And what was the primary goal of this religion? It was a well-ordered, harmonious society. That's what Confucius longed for in his time. Judaism. The founder or central figure, you could mention Abraham as the founder, and you could mention Moses as your central figure. And what was the ethical code or standard of behavior? Why not the Ten Commandments? Why not mention that? Was it monotheistic, polytheistic, or neither? Judaism was most definitely monotheistic. And then what is the primary goal of this religion? heaven to be with God. Hinduism, its founder or central figure is unknown. It's such an ancient religion that nobody can really be sure who the founder is. But the ethical code of behavior is karma. Is it monotheistic, polytheistic, or neither? It is polytheistic. And the primary goal of Hinduism is to attain moksha. Moksha is the release of the soul from these cycles of birth and rebirth um, when your soul is now free and you're done with all that. And that's moksha. Christianity's founder or central figure, Jesus, and its ethical code of behavior. You can mention the New Testament. You can mention even the, uh, the, the uh, Ten Commandments. And you can also mention the Beatitudes monotheistic, polytheistic, or neither. It's monotheistic. What is the goal? To get to heaven. Take as many people as you can with you. Buddhism. Its founder, central figure, is the Buddha. And uh, he was a real person, Siddhartha Gautama. And ethical code of behavior, the Eightfold Path. Was it polytheistic, monotheistic, or neither? It was neither. Buddhism isn't really, uh, doesn't really have a God. It's more of a spiritual path. And its goal is nirvana. When you have basically overcome all suffering through the release of selfish desires. Zoroastrianism, its founder was Zoroaster. Oh, ethical code of conduct, goodness. And um, polytheistic, monotheistic or neither some would say that it's monotheistic one um, religious thought that it does come up with is dualism keep that in mind and it's um, ultimate goal heaven getting into the post-classical byzantine empire the years of the byzantine empire went from 330 a.d to 1453 a.d its location the Eastern Mediterranean. Its capital, Constantinople. 
What made this capital city of Constantinople such a wealthy place? And the answer is trade. It sat between two continents and it sat at a crossroads between two seas. How did the Byzantine Empire come to be? Well, the Byzantine Empire had been the eastern half of the Roman Empire when it split. Compare Christianity in the east to Christianity in the west. Well, there's two big factors. In the east, you can say that it has a patriarch for its leadership, and it also has extensive use of icons in worship. The West has the Pope, and it tends not to use icons. So, who was Constantine, and why was he important to the Byzantine Empire? The Roman Empire from 306 to 337 AD was um, the Roman 3, 2, 1. Constantine was the Roman emperor from 306 to 337 AD. He founded the new Roman capital, Constantinople, which would become the capital of the Byzantine Empire. So who was Justinian and why was he important to the Byzantine Empire? Well, he was the Byzantine emperor from 527 AD to 565 AD. He established the Justinian Code and he built the huge Hagia Sophia Church. What rule of law was established in the Byzantine Empire? That's the Justinian Code. What happened in the Byzantine Empire as a result of the Justinian Code? Well, that code influenced the law in Europe for the next 900 years. So what factors led to the decline of the Byzantine Empire? Islamic invasions gradually reduced the empire in size until the Ottomans conquered Constantinople in the year 1453. The Franks. How did the Franks help the church gain power in Europe? Well, Clovis became a Christian and he successfully defended Rome against the Lombards and donated to Rome the territorial spoils of his campaign. He led the entire Frankish kingdom, the most powerful of all the Germanic kingdoms, to Christianity. And this facilitated much more, much more pr prominent role for the church in the lives of Europeans. So now we're looking at the post-classical Islamic civilizations. What was Muhammad able to do politically in Arabia in his own lifetime? Muhammad unified the Arabian Peninsula under Islam in his lifetime, although after he died, several places committed apostasy and turned away from Islam, and these were fairly quickly reconquered. Um, where did Islam, Islam spread in the 7th and 8th centuries? Um, they spread west all the way to Spain and east all the way to the borders of India. And then we've got this one. Why were the early Muslims able to, to defeat their neighboring empires so easily? Well, these neighboring empires were the Byzantines and the Sasanian Persians who had been fighting each other for decades and had greatly weakened each other when Islam emerged from the south of them. What were some achievements of the Muslim world? Well, we can divide these up into categories. For example, the technical and the scientific. The designed city of Baghdad was a cultural center. The mosque, scholarly medical works, cartography, the astrolabe, water wheels, dams, aqueducts, the classification of plants in different climate zones, the first hospitals, advanced medical books, synthesized from multiple sources, book binding, uh, original literature, and chess. Artistic accomplishments, elaborate geometric designs called arabesque, and uh, fancy writing called calligraphy. And it's thought that these were developed to compensate for the fact that in some Islamic doctrines, um, they looked down upon or even condemned the use of living creatures in religious art. Geographic advances. 
Um, they had to be good cartographers in order to manage this vast empire. And these developments were useful to the European explorers in the upcoming age of exploration. Mathematic uh, advances. Lots of mathematical concepts from the ancient Greeks and from India were preserved and transmitted by the Islamic world, like zero, algebra, and Arabic numerals. So at this time, here's a 50-50 here's a question, either or, were Europeans or Muslims more advanced? And um, uh, the answer is that the Muslims were. Europe was going through a long age of collapse and rebuilding during this time. How did Islamic civilization in Spain preserve Greek and Roman knowledge in Europe? Well, the Caliphate of Cordoba in Spain, al hakram II, sponsored a campaign to translate ancient Greek and Roman manuscripts into Arabic in order to preserve the ideas contained in them for future use. And the project included scholars from various faiths, and this contributed greatly to the intellectual life of Europe, uh, really in a golden age of science and mathematics in Spain. What mysterious institution preserved ancient knowledge in Baghdad? And these were, the, uh, these were in the great cities of Baghdad in Iraq, Cairo in Egypt, and Cordoba in Spain. These cities hosted great libraries and, in, and institutions of learning. And a prime example is the Great Library of Baghdad, also called the House of Wisdom. Historians debate over what the House of Wisdom actually was. Ancient texts refer to it, but there's no archaeological evidence of such a building in Baghdad. Some argue that ancient references to a House of Wisdom may simply have referred to the community of scholars who were active in Baghdad at the time. But either way, institutions like the House of Wisdom preserved ancient classical texts, China, the Tang and Sung dynasties. The years of the Tang dynasty were 618 to 907. The years of the Sung dynasty were 960 to 1279. Location, China. Capital of the Tang dynasty, Chiang'an. Capital of the Sung dynasty was Beijing. So where did the Tang and Sung dynasties trade? They traded along the Silk Road, as well as along the Indian Ocean trade network. What did the Song Dynasty develop into? Um, these were overrun by the Mongols, and the Mongols installed a new dynasty of conquest, which unified northern and southern China again. And remember that the Song Dynasty w was a significantly smaller dynasty than the Tang in terms of land area. Some achievements of the Tongue and, Tongue and Sung dynasties. Standardized coins, paper money that allowed taxes to be paid with money. They eliminated peasant dues to the emperor. They um, invented the abacus, gunpowder, the crossbow, the magnetic compass, rockets, and fine arrows. How did the Tang Dynasty influence the cultures around it, particularly Korea and Japan? Well, the Tang Dynasty spread Buddhism to Korea and Japan, and Buddhism transformed Japanese society. Japan converted to Buddhism in the year 548, and Japanese emperors, the shoguns, used Buddhism to exercise more social control over the country. Also, Japanese art took on elements that Buddhism carried with it. And what led to the decline of both the Tang and Sung dynasties? The dynastic cycle. African kingdom, the Bantu peoples, where did they spread? They spread southward into sub-Saharan Africa, all the way down south and to the east. And what were their influences? The Bantu tribes, as well as Arab traders, were Muslim, but this Muslim influence came later than the Muslim influence on East Africa and West Africa. 
the Ottomans, the Ottoman Turks. We're getting close to the end. 1299 all the way to 1922, their location was Anatolia. Their capital was Constantinople after the year 1453. And so who were these Ottomans originally? They were nomads from Central Asia who converted to Islam. So how did the Ottomans help in the decline of the Byzantine Empire? Well, they applied constant military pressure to the, to the Byzantine Empire until they finally destroyed it in the year 1453. Describe Suleiman the Magnificent? Well, he was the Ottoman Sultan. The Sultan is the ruler from 1520 to 1566. He's also called Suleiman the Lawgiver, and he ruled uh, 25 million people, and he was also a conqueror. What religion was the Ottoman Empire based on? Islam. And some achievements of the Ottoman Empire. Um, they controlled the Mediterranean. They united most of Islam, except for Persia and Afghanistan. The Janissaries, that was a slave army and a slave corps of administrators also. They had that. And they controlled vital trade routes. So what factors led to the decline of the Ottoman Empire? The empire fell behind technologically and lost in a competition against their adversaries, the Russians, and then they lost World War I. The Mughals. How did the Mughal Sultan Akbar the Great bring about a golden age in India during his time? Well, um, Akbar the Great was extremely tolerant of the Hindu and Buddhist religions, even ending the jizya, which was the tax on non-Muslims, and even promoting Hindu to the government. And both of these were very much against Islamic tradition. Well, let's talk about the Mongols. So who were the Mongols originally? They were nomadic pastoral people in the Central Asian steppes. So how did the Mongol conquest of China affect China? Well, they, the Mongols united northern and southern China. They placed their own ruling dynasty upon it, the Huan dynasty, and they encouraged Chinese commerce and trade, and they even moved their capital to China. So how did Mongol, the Mongol conquest affect Russia? Well, it isolated most of the Eastern Slavs from other European civilization. The Russians got Mongol words, Mongol, Mongol customs, Mongol clothing, Mongol administrative practices. Um, it, all of these found their way into the Russian culture. From the mid-1200s to the mid-1300s, they achieved the Pax Mongolica, and this brought stability and order to China. They also transmitted Chinese technologies such as gunpowder and the magnetic compass. And they also passed along diseases such as the Black Plague. And they destroyed the city of Kiev and increased the importance of the city of Moscow, which today is the capital of Russia. So who eventually replaced the Mongols as the great Islamic empire in Western Asia? That would be the Ottoman Turks. Let's move on to Europe. What institutional factor united Western Europe more than anything else during the Middle Ages? That would definitely be the church. United Europe politically, intellectually, economically, spiritually, and culturally. So what type of social, political, economic system did Europe use during the Middle Ages? And that would be the feudal system. What other civilization had a very similar system? That would be Japan. So describe what the feudalist system looked like during the Middle Ages in Europe. And it was overwhelmingly rural. It was overwhelmingly land-based, agricultural. There was a social pyramid um, with most people at the bottom as serfs and peasants. And the manor dominated the economy. So let's describe Europe's political composition during the feudal times. Europe was politically decentralized. The only institution that held Europe together politically was the church, and it provided the only stability and security. 
During the Middle Ages, who became the greatest landowner? That would be the Catholic Church. And how did the church become the greatest landowner during the Middle Ages? Nobles were often would often will large pieces of land to the church after they died, hoping that that would get them into heaven. After the fall of Rome, did Europe flourish or did Europe fall into a depression? And the answer was the depression. So the Crusades, what were those? This was 200 years of campaigns to supposedly reclaim the Holy Land from the Muslims. Who was fighting the Crusades? European Christians against Middle Eastern Muslims. So how did the Crusades help to contribute to the end of the Middle Ages? Europeans were introduced to new ideas and products which stimulated trade between the Middle East and Europe, which stimulated both commerce and banking, which contributed to the growth of towns and a need for education, hence the emergence of universities, all of which served to undermine the localized land-based feudal system, which was not designed to support these kinds of activities. What was the Hundred Years' War? It was actually a 116-year Middle Ages war between France and England that lasted from 1337 to 1453 which finally ended with France maintaining its throne and pushing the English out of France. So who was fighting and why were they fighting? The English and the French were fighting. They were fighting over the French throne. The English had a hereditary claim on the French throne that they felt was legitimate and valid, but the French kings and the French people did not feel the same way. So how did the Hundred Years' War bring about change to medieval Europe. They, this war introduced new weapons such as the longbow and artillery, and these weapons made common people more effective on the battlefield and gave them the ability to challenge the military dominance of knights and castles. The longbow could penetrate a knight's armor, and artillery could knock down a nobleman's castle walls. And so these two things undermined the entire feudal society, which depended on military dominance of knights and depended on castles. So what was the Great Western Schism, or you could also call it the Great Papal Schism? From 1378 to 1417, there were two to three competing popes, each claiming to be the legitimate pope, each declaring the other popes to be heretics and excommunicating them. So people didn't know who to believe. So how did the Great Schism bring an end to the Middle Ages in Europe? The church had been a powerful unifying force and political authority in the Middle Ages. Church crises such as the Babylonian captivity and the Great Western Schism from 1378 to 1417 caused people to doubt the church's legitimacy and authority. The Black Death. What happened to the population of Europe after the Black Death? Well, that population was re reduced by more than a third to possibly even being half. How did the Black Death travel so quickly? It followed trade routes, and it passed from one person to the next. So what was depicted in art during the Black Death in Europe? Art became obsessed with death and the impartial nature of death that everybody faced, whether you were rich or poor, whether you were a king or a serf, Everybody faced the same Black Death. And finally, how did the Black Death help end feudalism during Middle Ages Europe? Well, the Black Death reduced the population of Europe by between a third and half, and that caused a very severe labor shortage. And this gave serfs and urban laborers more bargaining power than they had before 
with their bosses, and they could command higher wages and better work arrangements. And this undermined the serf system in Western Europe. So next, if you've learned all that, take a stab at this matching section. Can you match these words with its definitions? All right, that's it for the review. I hope you find this helpful, and I hope you do great on your test.